It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, it's uh, an honor and a privilege to share ideas with all of you, with the uniformed and civilian leadership, and I greatly appreciate all of your dedication and sacrifice, uh, and I'm glad to be able to make a small contribution over the years. I've worked with John since 2002 on the Army Science Advisory Group, and I've shared ideas with this group, I think every other year, it's been 2002, four, six, and eight. And uh, in fact, I've updated these slides just recently from what I first presented in 2002, and uh, people asked, aren't you nervous whether these exponential trends are really gonna keep on that uh, exponential trajectory, a straight line on a logarithmic graph, and I said, I've done this a number of times now, I'm pretty confident this will work out, but as you'll see, it's pretty amazing just how predictable the exponential progression of information technology is. It's predictable and it's exponential, uh, which is ultimately very surprising in its effects, because people think linearly. We don't actually think exponentially. I think that's hardwired. Uh, intelligence makes predictions, and when we were walking through the savannah a thousand years ago, we'd make linear predictions where that predator would be in a few seconds, and, and those linear predictions may, worked out very well. Uh, and sophisticated scientists have had these debates with Nobel Prize winners, and uh, they make linear extrapolations about, based on, uh, of the future, based on current trends, uh, and th that's why we underestimate what will happen in a long period of time. Because if I take 30 steps linearly, one, two, three, four, five, I get to 30. If I take 30 steps exponentially, two, four, eight, 16, I get to a billion. It makes a huge difference, and that, and that in fact describes the nature of the progression of information technology. And it's not just Moore's law. It ultimately affects anything in which we can measure the information content, and ultimately that will be everything. Uh, within computation, we've already seen that when I was a student at MIT. I went there in 1965 because MIT was so advanced in 1965 that it actually had its own computer and thousands of us shared it. Uh, it took up half a building. The computer in your cell phone today is a million times smaller, a million times less expensive, and a thousand times more powerful than the computer we all shared 40 years ago. So that's a billion-fold increase in price performance we've seen in the last 40 years. We're actually in speeding up the rate of exponential growth, so we'll see that again. As influential as this technology is already, we'll see it again in another 25 years. Uh, there'll be another million-fold shrinking and billion-fold increase in price performance in the next 25 years. So what used to fit in a building now fits in your pocket. What now fits in your pocket will fit inside a blood cell, and it will dramatically change a lot of the things we do, from weapons, self-organizing swarm weapon systems to nanobots in our bloodstream that can keep us healthy. And as I mentioned, it's not just Moore's Law. First of all, Moore's Law was just one of the paradigms that brought exponential growth to computing. That exponential growth to computing started decades before Gordon Moore was even born. And Moore's Law was the fifth, not the first paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. And computing itself is just one of the areas that's affected by this exponential growth. Another one that's important to all of us is health and medicine. Now, that was not an information technology just a few years ago. In fact, when we started working together, we didn't have the genome, we didn't have RNA interference, we didn't have gene therapy that worked, we didn't have means of simulating biological processes uh, just when we started a few years ago. Now we have all those things. And the genome actually was a good example of the exponential growth I'm talking about because when that was announced, the Human Genome Project in 1990, skeptics said, there's no way you're going to finish this in 15 years. We just had our best equipment and most advanced doctoral students from around the world. And around the world, we collected one ten thousandth of the genome. This is going to take centuries. And halfway through the project, seven and a half years into this 15-year project, the skeptics were still going strong, saying, I told you this wasn't going to work. Here you are halfway through the project, and you finished one percent of the project. But that was actually right on schedule because it had been doubling small numbers, and if you double 1% seven more times, you get to 100%, and that's exactly what happened. 
got finished actually early. Uh, we've continued to double the amount of genetic data we've sequenced every year. The cost has continued to come down by half every year. And this exponential progression affects many other areas of biology, the proteome project, the connectome project. And we now have the means of actually changing genes, not just in a baby, but in a mature individual. We can turn genes off with RNA interference. That got recognized just a few years later with the Nobel Prize. It usually takes decades. It's another example of the acceleration. There's a lot of genes we'd like to turn off that accelerate aging or disease. We can add new genes. I'm involved with a project where we take cells out of the body, add a gene in vitro, then inspect that it got done correctly, multiply it a million fold, also inspect that it doesn't have any other DNA errors, uh, and then inject these million cells, which are your cells, that with a gene added, back into the body, and this uh, goes through the bloodstream and ends up back in the lungs, because these are lung cells, and this has cured a, a fatal disease, pulmonary hypertension. And there's over a thousand drugs and processes in the development and testing pipeline using these methodologies to actually change this outdated software that runs in our bodies. And, we, and rather than just finding interventions, which is how drug development has been done up until just recently, drug development was called drug discovery, we can actually design these interventions on computers and then test them out on increasingly sophisticated biological simulators. And all of this is in an early stage, but the point is that now that these technologies are an information technology, they're subject to what I call the law of accelerating returns, this exponential growth, roughly doubling every year uh, in terms of power, capacity, price performance, bandwidth, uh, capability. So these technologies, which are now in the early stage, will be a thousand times more powerful in 10 years, a million times more powerful in 20 years, and it will deeply affect all of medicine, which of course is a major part of, uh, of the Army's mission in terms of the well-being of the soldier. It deeply affects all of us. Uh, this also has many other implications in terms of uh, military strategy, which I, will, which I will come to. Even technologies like energy, which doesn't seem like an information technology, and fossil fuels are not an information technology. That's a 19th century early industrial, first industrial revolution technology. But now that we're actually applying nanotechnology, beginning to, which is a form of information technology, nanotechnology ultimately means applying massively parallel computerized processes to reorganize matter and energy at the molecular level to create new materials and new devices, uh, and that is accelerating at an exponential pace. So there are new solar panels, for example, coming out that utilize early nanotechnology principles that are much more efficient, less expensive, and I'll show you these graphs. We, we're coming down rapidly in the cost of solar energy, and the amount of solar energy we're producing is doubling, not every year, every two years, but it's only eight doublings away uh, from meeting 100% of our energy needs. It's been doubling every two years, by the way, for 20 years. And it's very easy to dismiss these things when they're at an early stage, like the ARPANET, which came out of the Department of Defense. I saw that in the eight, early 80s, when it really just connected a few thousand scientists. And, but doubling every year is multiplying by 1,000 in 10 years. So I predicted that by, by the mid-1990s, this would be a World Wide Web connecting hundreds of millions of people and providing people all around the globe direct access to <coughs> information and knowledge sources and creating social networks. And this was dismissed as ridiculous when the entire defense budget could only tie together a few thousand scientists. But it happened right on schedule. Uh, the genome project was dismissed when it was only 1% of the human genome. It's very easy to dismiss these things and ignore the revolutionary implications of exponential growth. But that's the nature of this kind of progression. So I want to show you quickly just how pervasive this is, how predictable it is, and how ultimately transformative it is to everything we care about, including defending our nation. And as I say, I've upda just updated these graphs for this conference uh, up to 2007. And it, it, it's amazing to me just how predictable this phenomenon is. Because people say you can't predict the future. And that's true when it comes to specific projects, you know, specific companies, specific initiatives, specific 
standards, you know, will WiMAX G3, G4, CDMA be the next wireless standard? These things are hard to predict. But if you ask me, you know, what will it cost for a MIPS of computing in 2010, or how much will it cost to sequence a base pair of DNA in 2012, or the spatial resolution of brain scanning in 2014, I can give you a figure. It's likely to be correct. I, I'm, I'm saying this now, not just looking backwards and overfitting to past data. I've been making these forward-looking predictions for 30 years. And I got into this because of my interest in being an inventor and realizing that most inventors fail, not because they can't get their gadgets to work, but because the timing is wrong. So I became an ardent student of technology trends and discovered that if you can measure the underlying information properties, they're remarkably predictable. Uh, this, by the way, is, was my first major invention. It was the size of a washing machine. It was a printed speech reading machine for the blind. This is the current version, and it's a lot more capable. It's 5,000 times smaller, reads 16 languages, can translate from one language to another, and has a lot of other capabilities. So it's an example of the benefits of uh, exponential growth. Uh, and the exponential progression of information technology allows the adoption of these technologies to occur more and more rapidly, because that's a major opportunity and challenge for the Army, because we need to adopt the cycle of development and deployment of these new technologies more rapidly uh, because of this phenomena. But these, by the way, are logarithmic graphs. So every level on, this, on these graphs are 10 times greater than the level below it. A straight line on a logarithmic graph is exponential growth. Well, the telephone took 50 years to be adopted by a quarter of the US population. Cell phone did that in seven years. These early technologies, telephone, radio, television, took decades to be adopted by a mass audience. Uh, the, the web, PC, mobile phone were adopted in just a few years' time. This acceleration has continued. I mean, think back six or seven years ago, uh, you know, around the time that John, you and I got started, most people didn't use search engines. I mean, imagine life without search engines. That sounds like ancient history. That was only six years ago. Social networks, wikis, blogs, many of these phenomena are only a few years old. And I have a whole theory as to why this is the case. Technology is an evolutionary process, just like biology has been, because it's survival of the fittest. And an evolutionary process evolves a capability and then adopts that capability so the whole process of evolution gets more sophisticated, so the next stage goes more quickly. Uh, this is a double logarithmic graph. On the x-axis, it's how many years ago this paradigm shift took place in powers of 10. On the y-axis, it's how many years it took for this paradigm shift to be adopted. So the very first paradigm shift, basically biology itself, DNA, so that biological evolution had an information backbone to keep track of its experiments, that took a billion years to evolve. But then biological evolution adopted it. It's used it ever since. The next stage, the Cambrian explosion, when all the body plans of the animals evolved, that went 100 times faster. And biological evolution kept accelerating, getting faster and faster. The first technology creating species evolved in only a few hundred thousand years, really a blink of an eye in biological evolutionary terms. And then adopting Homo sapiens as the cutting edge of evolution, the next stage, which is human-directed cultural and technological evolution, went a little bit faster. That only took tens of thousands of years for stone tools, fire, the wheel. And then we always use the latest technology to create the next technology, and technology has continued to accelerate. And it emerges smoothly from the biological evolution that led to the technology-creating species. Now, some people criticize this graph, saying Kurzweil only put points on this graph if they fit on the straight line. And if uh, I had points that didn't fit on the straight line, I didn't bother to include them. So to address that, I took 15 different lists. And these were thinkers and reference works not trying to either make or break my point. This is just what they thought were the key events, the key paradigm shifts in biological and technological evolution. Carl Sagan's Cosmic Calendar, American Museum of Natural History, Encyclopedia Britannica, and you can see there is some disagreement. Some people include the ARPANET with the Internet, so it's 25 years, not 10 years. Some people feel the Cambrian explosion took 25 million years and not 10 million years. There's a lot of disagreement when human language started. So there is some spreading of the points. But there's a very clear 
trend line, a very clear, undeniable, inexorable acceleration. Nobody thinks the internet took a million years. Nobody thinks the Cambrian explosion happened in 10 years. Uh, there's an undeniable acceleration in this biological and, and technological evolutionary process. And here on a linear graph, I distinguish a linear and exponential progression. And you can see they are very similar, actually, at first. In fact, exponential growth can be sublinear when you're doubling very little numbers at first. But ultimately, it becomes quite explosive. And uh, another criticism of my projections is, well, Kurzweil takes these exponentials and just projects them out indefinitely. And we all know that exponential growth can't go on forever. If you have two rabbits in Australia, you get four rabbits, eight rabbits, 16 rabbits, but that doesn't go on forever. Finally, the rabbits eat up all the foliage and the exponential growth comes to a halt. Uh, and that's true for information technology as well. Every paradigm that brings exponential growth to an underlying technology does finally run out of resources. But what happens in information technology, and this has happened already five times in the history of computation, is as we get to the end of the line of a particular paradigm, it leads to research pressure for the next paradigm. And the next paradigm is generally there in time. I mean, here we have five different paradigms through the history of computation, going back to the 1890 census. And then uh, the relay-based computers that were used in World War II allowed the Allies to crack the German Enigma code with the relay-based computers that Alan Turing and his colleagues developed, then vacuum tube computers in the 1950s. Uh, CBS predicted the election of Eisenhower, the first time the networks did that, with vacuum tube-based computers. And then there were shrinking vacuum tubes. Every year, they made the vacuum tube smaller and smaller to keep this exponential growth going. That finally hit a wall. They couldn't shrink the vacuum tube anymore and keep the vacuum. And that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes. But it was not the end of the exponential growth of computation. That we then went to the fourth paradigm, transistors, and then the fifth paradigm, Moore's law, and the shrinking of component sizes on an integrated circuit. And there's been regular predictions that that would come to an end. The first prediction by Gordon Moore was 2002. Intel now says 2022. And uh, by that time, the key features will be four nanometers. That's about 20 carbon atoms. And we won't be able to shrink them anymore. But we'll then go to the sixth paradigm, which is self-organizing three-dimensional molecular circuits. When I talked about that in my 1999 book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, that was then a controversial notion. There's been so much progress, including getting these types of circuits to work, uh, that this is now very much a mainstream uh, idea. Justin Ratner, the chief technology officer of, of Intel, will tell you, as he did recently at a conference, uh, that they have these circuits working in their labs. They expect the crossover to be in the teen years, well before we run out of steam with flat integrated circuits. So this is one of the graphs I just updated to 2007, because I had it to about 2001 when I spoke here at the 2002 Army Science Conference. And you can see it's continuing very much on this exponential progression. I mean, the scale of the improvement is hidden by a logarithmic graph because this represents trillions fold improvement in price performance. As I mentioned, it's a billion fold just since I was a student in 1965. Uh, but aside from that fantastic progress, look at how smooth and predictable a progression this is. And this is not some government mandated program. This is not the output of some tabletop experiment. This is the measure of the innovation, the invention, the drama, the IPOs and bankruptcies and competing programs of different military organizations around the world uh, of millions of people. And out of all that unpredictable human activity, we get this very predictable progression. We had a lot of history during the 20th century. Two world wars, the Cold War, the Great Depression, a few other things happened. And out of all that unpredictable human history, you get this very remarkable, inexorable progression of the power of information technology. And I don't want to dwell on all these examples of electronics because you're familiar with them. Uh, but hey, look at this one. All of these have been updated to 2007, just, just recently. Uh, so when I was a high school student, 
Growing up in New York, I would buy something bigger than this for $50. I could switch one bit based on telephone relays. 1968, I could buy a whole transistor that could do that for just $1. And now you can buy about $300 million for a dollar. Okay, again, you've heard these fantastic comparisons, but look at how smooth and predictable a progression this is. And I've been making these forward-looking predictions based on this for 30 years. And uh, it's not the case that a transistor is a transistor. Uh, as we made them sm smaller, they're faster, and electrons have less distance to travel. So the cost of a transistor cycle has been coming down by half about every year. That's a doubling of price performance every year. And that's about a 50% deflation rate. And the uh, economists will worry about deflation as well as inflation. They're actually back on worrying about deflation. We had massive deflation during the Depression, and there's been actually some recent deflation. And the concern is if you can actually get twice as much stuff every year for, uh, for the same amount of money, people aren't going to actually double their consumption to keep up with that. They, they'll buy more if it's cheaper, but they're not going to buy twice as much. So the size of the economy as measured in constant currency will shrink. And for a variety of actually good reasons, that would not be a good thing. But actually, that's not what we find. We find that we more than double our consumption of every form of information technology year after year. There's been 18% growth in constant dollars uh, in every form of information technology for the last 50 years, uh, despite the fact that you can get twice as much of it every year for the same cost. And the reason is, as price performance reaches certain levels, whole new applications explode on the landscape. People didn't buy iPods for $10,000, which is what it would have cost 12 years ago. Uh, as the price performance reached a certain level, that application took off. And we see that in, in application after application. Magnetic data storage, I just put that up because it's not Moore's law. This is not shrinking transistors on an integrated circuit. This is shrinking magnetic spots on a substrate. Different engineers, different companies, same progression. It really is a phenomena that actually has its roots in biological evolution. And I mentioned the bi biotechnology revolution, DNA sequencing costs coming down by half every year, the amount of genetic data we've sequenced, communication technology. This is uh, of great significance in every area, including military technology. Uh, just as the P Department of Defense developed what became the Internet, uh, that recently have developed the worldwide mesh concept so that you can drop a platoon of soldiers in a place and all the communication will self-organize and, and there's no central hub to it. So if pieces of it uh, become inoperative, the information will root around it. Basically, every device, I mean, right now, your cell phone is not a node on a network. It's a spoke into a network. And, but in the worldwide mesh concept, every device becomes a node on the internet. So you not only use it for your own communications, it's also passing other people's messages. It's also providing computation and communication resources. If it goes down, the information just roots around it. Uh, and this is a working concept. Intel, Google, Microsoft have actually adopted it. And uh, that is the, the, the wave of the future. I mean, right now, 99% of the computes on the internet are unused. You've got all these computers that are sitting there waiting for the next keystroke, and they're not utilized. Uh, you might as, they might as well contribute their memory, their computational resources, their communication bandwidth to the overall network. So cloud computing has become a concept, but right now cloud computing is still using someone else's server farm. The idea is really to have everybody's computer contributing to the cloud and have it self-organizing as pieces of it come in and out of operation. Uh, and all of this is uh, growing at an exponential rate. Here's a graph I had. I had a little piece of this in the 1980s, just the first few dots on this one. It was the ARPANET. And I uh, projected that would continue. Actually, as it became the internet, it took a little jump up. Uh, but I predicted this would be a World Wide Web by the mid-1990s. Uh, and now that doesn't seem like such a revolutionary prediction, but at the time it seemed ridiculous and was heavily criticized. Uh, and if we look at the same data on a linear scale, this is the same information. 
It looks like the World Wide Web came out of nowhere in the mid-1990s, but you could see it coming uh, if you looked at the uh, underlying exponential expansion. We're shrinking technology, not just electronic, but mechanical technology, at a factor of about 100 in 3D volume per decade. So these technologies will be 100,000 times smaller in 25 years. And we're actually now building systems at the molecular level. Uh, those, by the way, were illustrations from Eric Drexler's book, Engines of Creation, uh, which was a controversial MIT thesis 20 years ago. And the primary application is, again, in health and medicine, uh, but also developing small swarm weapons uh, based on features at a very small scale, ultimately at the molecular scale. And if I were to say someday you'll have millions of nanorobots in your bloodstream going inside your body keeping you healthy, you'd say, all right, that sounds a little futuristic. There's already 50 experiments of doing that with the first generation of nano-engineered devices in the bloodstream of animals. One scientist cured type 1 diabetes with a blood cell size device that lets insulin out in a controlled fashion, blocks antibodies. There's a, at MIT, they have a blood cell size device that can detect cancer cells based on the antigens on their surface. It then blocks them and destroys them. Uh, this is a design of a biological red blood cell made into a robotic device called a respirocyte. It's actually a fairly simple device, and it's been thoroughly analyzed. And it brings up an interesting observation about biology, uh, which we've known for a long time in the Army, which is biology is very intricate and very clever, but it's also very suboptimal compared to what we actually actually can build once we understand how biology works. And particularly if we can build things at the molecular level through nanotechnology, we can build them to be thousands or even millions of times more capable. We do our switching in our brain uh, with systems that switch 200 times per second. That's a million times slower than computers. Uh, in the brain, information is transmitted using chemical signals that travel a few hundred feet per second. That's a million times slower than electronics. These respirocytes are thousands of times more capable than their biological counterparts. If you were to replace a portion of your red blood cells with these robotic versions, you could do an Olympic sprint for 15 minutes without taking a breath or sit at the bottom of your pool for four hours. So, I mean, these will enhance human performance. Uh, in fact, if, if a person's heart were disrupted for some reason, uh, this would keep them alive for, for up to four hours. We'll have plenty of computation to do things like simulate the human brain at low cost as we go into the 2020s. But then the key issue is, will we have the software? And first of all, I would point out that we already have a lot of artificial intelligence deeply embedded in our infrastructure. Uh, sometimes people ask me, well, whatever happened to artificial intelligence? And it reminds me of people that go into the rainforest and say, where are all the species that are supposed to be here? when there's 25 species of ants within 50 feet of them, but they don't see them because they're hidden in the echo structure. AI is all around us. Every time you send an email or connect a cell phone call, intelligent algorithms route the information. Search is incre increasingly intelligent. Pick up any product. It was designed in part through intelligent computer systems design, assembled in robotic factories, inventory levels controlled with, by intelligent just-in-time inventory systems. Intelligent algorithms to automatically detect credit card fraud, uh, fly and land airplanes, guide intelligent weapon systems, automatically diagnose electrocardiograms, blood cell images. I could mention a hundred other applications of uh, systems that are performing intelligent functions that used to require human intelligence and are now doing them in an automated fashion at equal or better levels. Now, they're narrow in that the, these systems are performing specific functions, but the narrowness is gradually broadening as more and more AI systems are aggregated together and the systems become more flexible, and as we learn more about the best example we have of human intelligence, which is the human brain itself. And it's not hidden from us. Uh, the spatial resolution of brain scanning is doubling every year. We can now see individual interneural connections we can see new synapses and spines forming as we think. We can actually see in a living brain, your brain creates your thoughts, and your thoughts create your brain, because there is that feedback loop. 
And we're also showing you we can turn this data into working models and simulations of the brain. Doug Hofstadter has mused for years, well, maybe our intelligence is just below that level necessary to understand our brain. And if we were smarter and able to understand it, well, then our brain would have to be that much more complicated and maybe we'd never catch up with it. And maybe there's a math theorem in there that a complex system can't be so complex as to understand its own complexity. Turns out that's not the case. We actually can and are turning this data into working simulations. This is a block diagram of a dozen regions of the auditory cortex that have been modeled and simulated. And sophisticated psychoacoustic tests applied to the simulation, they get the same results as applying those tests to human auditory perception. There's also a simulation of the visual system that's been tested, of the cerebellum, which is where we do our scale formation. Uh, this comprises half the neurons in the brain. We, we always, this is where, for example, you catch a fly ball. And you see the fly ball and you kind of know where to move your hand. Uh, we always wondered, how does a 10-year-old kid do that? I mean, all she has to do is solve a dozen simultaneous differential equations in two seconds. And most 10-year-olds haven't taken calculus. So we didn't really understand how that worked. But actually, the cerebellum does solve those equations uh, without our conscious awareness. You have to train it in order to do that. That's why you need to practice the skill. And we have now working models and simulations of that process. There are early models and simulations of slices of the cerebral cortex where we do our abstract reasoning. So this is scaling up at an exponential pace. And one underlying question is how complicated is the brain? I mean, one of the arguments uh, and one of the debates I've had frequently is, well, the brain is a vast complexity. You know, you'd need a program with a billion lines of code. Uh, that's simply not the case because the design of the brain is in the genome. The genome I show in my book only has about 50 million bytes of information in it. It's 800 million bytes uncompressed, but it's replete with redundancies. One length, lengthy sequence called ALU is repeated 300,000 times, and there's a lot of this repetition. So, you know, if you have a lot of repetition, you can uh, do lossless compression and uh, represent it with much less data. So I, I do that analysis. There's about 50 million bytes of unique information in the genome. About half of that, 25 million bytes, is the design of the brain. Now, if you look at a human brain, it looks a lot more complicated. In fact, the complexity multiplies a billion fold because there's a lot of randomness in how the brain is initially wired. And then it self-organizes in uh, reaction to a complex environment. Uh, for example, the cerebellum, if I were to hand you the cerebellum and say, here, reverse engineer this, and you'd look at this with its literally trillions of connections, you'd go, my God, this is going to take centuries. But we have figured it out. It's actually only tens of thousands of bytes of information in the design. There's only a few genes that control the process. Basically says, uh, wire one module like this, it's four different types of neurons, now repeat 10 billion times and add some random variation within the following constraints with each repetition. And then you have this largely stochastically wired cerebellum that then responds and learns skills as, as a person learns to walk and talk and catch a fly ball and so on. So my point is not that the cerebellum, that the brain is simple, it's not, but it's a level of complexity that we can handle and are handling and are modeling and simulating and those are scaling up at an exponential pace. All of this is what is driving economic growth because it is the information technologies and industries that are growing, as I mentioned, by 18% a year. And the, the amount of the economy that's comprised of information is growing. So more of it becomes uh, described by that 18%. And the various recessions, even the depression, are, are, is a curve overlaid on that basic uh, growth pattern and the economy snaps back to where it would have been had those recessions or depression never occurred in the first place. You can hardly see the, uh, the recessions. You can see the Great Depression, but it actually snaps back to where it would have been had that uh, never occurred in the first place. And uh, labor productivity is what is driving this through automation. We've gone from $30 to $130 in the average value of an hour of human labor. Uh, in constant dollars over the last 45 years. And the adoption of these technologies is also exponential. 
This is e-commerce. It's now $2 trillion. Yeah, it will be the largest nation in the world within a decade if it were a nation, but it actually doesn't respect national boundaries. In fact, a lot of things don't respect national boundaries, like missiles or biological weapons. I mean, we do increasingly live in a, a borderless world. Uh, and, but this has been smooth exponential growth and you might, have said, you might say, now wait a second, wasn't there a boom and a bust in these dot-coms uh, in the late 1990s? How come we don't see that? You don't see that because that was a Wall Street phenomenon, not a Main Street phenomenon. The actual adoption of the Internet was just smooth exponential growth. The investment community looked at the Internet in the 1990s and said, wow, this is going to change everything. This is going to turn every business model on its head. That was accurate, but it wasn't going to do it instantly. If you remember my Internet graph, it was growing exponentially, but it took a decade till it started doubling big numbers and made a difference. So Wall Street came back around the year 2000 and said, gee, it hasn't changed everything. It hasn't actually changed anything. I guess we were wrong, and all the values went the other way. But meanwhile, it was growing exponentially. And now, you know, you can argue whether Google's 30 to 1 P ratio is high or low, but it's not 10,000 to 1, and they have $15 billion of real revenue, and there's $2 trillion of real dot-com revenue, and it's become a significant phenomenon. And this sexual uh, boom-bust psychology is actually an accurate harbinger of what is ultimately uh, a profound transformation. Same thing happened in telecommunications, happened in AI, even happened with the railroads in the 19th century. There was the same boom-bust psychology. And intellectual property is increasing. Education is increasing because we are destroying jobs at the bottom of the scale ladder, adding new jobs, and actually adding more new jobs than the jobs we're destroying at the top of the scale ladder. They pay eight times as much in constant dollars, and we are investing more in education to provide those higher level of skills. And I'll have a little bit more to say about American education in a few minutes. Uh, but we had 50,000 college students in 1870. It's six or seven million today. We're spending 10 times as much in constant dollars per capita on K through 12 education. And I'll just quickly mention solar energy, but I mean, this is the most relevant graph. This is a doubling for the last 20 years in the amount of solar energy we're producing every two years. And so now it's, a, it's under 1%. It's easy to dismiss. It's under 1%, it's kind of a minor player. Uh, but what's ignored is the exponential growth. We're only eight doublings with uh, two years each. Uh, from it being 100% of our energy needs. And then the question is, well, do we really have enough sunlight? And we actually have 10,000 times more sunlight than we need. We only have to capture one part in 10,000. There's 10 to the 17th watts that fall on, of sunlight that fall on the Earth. We only need 10 to the 13th to meet 100% of our energy needs. We also need energy storage, but we're also applying nanotechnology to that. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of these other countries like Germany and China are are ahead of us on that. Uh, but what's driving this is this rapid fall in the cost of, of solar energy. And uh, let me show you another example of a technology we've put together. Uh, we, as I mentioned, now have as a shipping product uh, this cell phone, which will translate from one language to another. You can just snap a picture of a printed document, like a store sign, sign on a wall, a menu in Germany or France, in any of 16 languages translated to any other language. And we have a prototype of doing that now voice-to-voice -voice, uh, using our own speech recognition, which we first developed in the 80s and is still in continuous development. Uh, we developed the first speech synthesis in the in 1970s, and that's been in continuous development. We took the latest versions of that with language translation and created a translating telephone. And this will be a routine service of your cell phone early in the next decade. This is a demonstration, comma. Dies ist eine Demonstration. Of a prototype. Of a quote translating end quote telephone. Period. Von einem Prototyp eines übersetzenden Telefons. Within a few years, comma. Innerhalb einiger Jahre. We will be able to talk to anyone, comma. Wir werden fähig sein, zu jemandem zu reden, 
regardless of their language. Period. Ohne Rücksicht auf ihre Sprache. The rain in Spain. Comma. La pluie en Espagne. Stays mainly in the plain. Period. Reste dans la plaine principalement. Merci pour votre attention. Period. Thank you for your attention. So let me draw a few implications. Uh, computers are getting smaller and smaller. They're integrating more and more with who we are. They're in our pockets. Ultimately, will be in our clothing. Uh, we will solve this problem that people like large displays on the one hand, but they also like to get their, carry them around in their pockets uh, by putting them in our eyeglasses. The Army does have prototypes like this. It's a very impressive device like this at Stanford uh, that can not only create a virtual display harboring in air that doesn't move as you move your head because it tracks your head mo movement, but it can also put you in a full immersion virtual reality environment. And virtual reality is, is one of the important themes which John and others have articulated for Army technologies. So we can take the soldier out of the weapon, and, but put the soldier in a virtual reality environment as if he or she were in the weapon, or just for training for weapons where they may be inside the weapon. Uh, and we're going to uh, have a real integration of language translation, search capability. Search engines won't wait to be asked. They'll be tracking your conversation. If they see you getting stuck with something, there'll be little pop-ups in your visual field of view. Uh, giving you helpful information. By 2029, these devices will be not only integrated with our clothing, but with our bodies and brains. Uh, we will have completed the reverse engineering of the human brain, which will give us very powerful algorithms for human-level intelligence. But it's not an alien invasion of intelligent machines to displace us. It is going to be an expansion of who we are, just as it is today. I mean, the fact that I can take a device out of my pocket and access all of human knowledge with a few keystrokes. That was unimaginable a decade ago, but we take it for granted now. And that's actually a good message. As these things become feasible, we take them for granted very quickly. Uh, but that's an expansion of who we are. There's no question we all achieve far more work uh, because of these uh, knowledge and intelligence amplifying tools than we could without that. Uh, I've got teams now of three or four people that, who in a few months uh, create software projects that you know used to take 200 people uh, years. So we are cre we are amplifying our productivity, our intellectual capability uh, by being by amplifying them with our intellectual tools, and that's going to continue as they get closer to us. I mean, it used to be I had to go across campus to get to the computer. Now it's in my pocket. It ultimately will be in my bodies and brains. This will be this will continue our expansion of human longevity. It was not in the interest of the human species for people to live past their 20s a thousand years ago. Human life expectancy was 37 in 1800. There was no sanitation, no antibiotics. It's now pushing 80. This progress has been the result of health and medicine being a hit or miss affair, not being an information technology. Now that it's become an information technology with the genome and the ability to change our genes and change, turn on and off enzymes and proteins and design and simulate these processes on, on biological simulators, this is now going to proceed at an exponential pace. According to my models, we'll be adding more than a year every year, not just to infant life expectancy, but to your remaining life expectancy uh, each year in about 15 years. Uh, and uh, we'll continue from that point. So if we look at the implications for the Army and for the armed forces, in general, I mean, one thing we need to consider, which I mentioned earlier, is to continue to bring down the cycle time of introducing new innovations. We, this has already been many steps. It started with the armed predator of taking the soldier out of the weapon. It can be a dangerous place to be, although actually being in an Abrams tank is, turns out to be a very safe place to be with all the technology that protects the soldier. Uh, but we ha once you take the soldier out of the weapon, you can make the weapon smaller, you can have the weapon do things uh, which would be impossible if you had to uh, worry about the survival of the inhabitants. 
Uh, you don't have to have life support. You can take greater risks. And you can still have soldiers in charge of it, uh, which is where virtual reality comes in. Uh, but it also can be used for training systems. Uh, and we can also go begin to miniaturize these weapons. Obviously, a tank can become a much smaller vehicle if you don't have human beings inside. And you can, in fact, develop weapons at many different scales, from smart dust to golf ball-sized weapons to swarm weapons uh, to small vehicles. Uh, you can really continue uh, development progressions at each, at each level of size and complexity. And uh, swarm weapons will be uh, a very important phenomena, uh, certainly within two decades, uh, where these devices will be uh, self-organizing, uh, which is a principle we are already applying to our communication capabilities. And information flow is, of course, critical to all of this. As you get more and more devices, uh, maintaining uh, control of your own devices, secure control uh, is par of paramount importance. Uh, cyber warfare is already a major issue. You need to present that information in an optimal form to every human participant, to every device. Uh, so depending on you know, whether it's a commander or an inf infantry person, uh, that those presentations will be very different. They need to get the information they need to make real-time decisions, and you need to present it to every device. And as the devices replicate and you get you know, millions of devices in the theater, uh, that gets to be a very complex uh, phenomena. But the technologies and ideas to do this uh, exist and are being developed. Um, and all of this needs to be self-organizing. Uh, because that provides the most robust uh, survivability. And a major issue which I've been involved in is bioterrorism. And the Army is actually the agency of the U.S. government responsible for uh, bioterrorism protection. And of course, there are programs for each one of the known agents, anthrax, smallpox, and so on. But the real specter here is that someone can design something that's brand new. And that's actually not so futuristic. That, that capability has existed for some time. A routine college bioengineering lab can take a benign virus, let's say a flu virus, and modify it to be more deadly, more communicable, more stealthy. And we would then be faced with an exponentially expanding threat uh, that would uh, expand very quickly uh, that we've never seen before. And the good news is we actually have the scientific ideas to defend ourselves from this, but we need to put this into practice in a rapid response system. Uh, the key to this is being able to sequence a virus very quickly. It took us five years to sequence HIV. We sequenced SARS in 31 days. We can now sequence a virus in one or two days. And John and I have discussed a system, for example, where a new virus emerges, we can sequence it in a day or two, create either a new form of vaccine based on antigens on the surface of that virus, uh, therefore it does not contain the whole virus and is, is safe, and then also applying RNA interference to create antiviral medications. RNA interference turns off uh, genes. Well, va uh, viruses are genes. They just happen to be pathological ones, and uh, RNA interference can turn off gene, uh, viruses. And so you could develop an RNA interference-based medication very quickly, gear up manufacturing. There's the whole issue of, you know, how do you test these things? The paradigm of going through years of FDA testing obviously doesn't work in an emergency situation. Uh, we've actually done exactly this in the area of software viruses. I mean, the Internet wouldn't survive if we didn't have a rapid response system. Every day, new viruses emerge. We capture them, reverse engineer them, create an antidote, spread that out virally on the internet, and within 24 hours we have protection from some new software virus. And if we didn't do that, the internet would break down very quickly. We need to do something comparable in the area of biological viruses. And uh, I'll say one more, make one more point, which is key to all of this is education, which I mentioned earlier. 
And the good news is we do, I'm on the board now of MIT and I've had close relationships since I was a student 40 years ago. And the quality of technology education uh, is unparalleled in the United States. There still aren't institutions like MIT and our other leadership universities for high quality technology education, which is why people come here from around the world. But we're not making the investment to expand that capability. I mean, I've got a lot of graphs and they all look like this. The Asian uh, investment in education and the productivity is, it looks like my exponential graphs and the uh, United States is pretty much flat. Uh, China's gone from 15,000 engineers a year to 300,000. You know, we went from 60,000 to 53,000. And uh, all these graphs in different areas of science and engineering, bachelor level, doctoral level, uh, show the same phenomena. Uh, I just got back from China, and they're building brand new universities, which are quite beautiful campuses and very eager students. And uh, the quality is not the same yet as our institutions, but they're getting there. Uh, they're good enough for China to do little things like take over the world's manufacturing. Um, so this is an area of concern. I know John has, is concerned about this as well. There's an army program to foster interest by junior high school and high school kids uh, in the sciences and engineering, but we need to do more uh, about that. And we are making progress in protecting our democracy and our liberty uh, while also respecting human life. And, I mean, people forget, you know, wars, uh, the scale of uh, casualties in wars used to be measured in the many millions. Uh, and this has come down uh, very dramatically. Uh, there's a countervailing phenomenon here, which is we, at the same time, we now have a front row seat on all of these uh, battles. If there's a battle in Fallujah, everybody sees it in their living room. Back in World War II, you know, there may be a major battle where tens of thousands of soldiers were killed. And if you saw it at all, it was in a grainy newsreel two weeks later in a movie theater. Uh, so it doesn't appear that way to the general public. Uh, but we do have a respect uh, for human life, both uh, our own soldiers as well as uh, collateral dam damage to a civilian population. Uh, and a lot of this technology is meeting our needs of defending our liberty uh, while protecting human life at the same time. Uh, so I think the message is that uh, these technologies are going to continue. Uh, this is going to be inexorable. It's not going to be dependent on a recession or any other factors. As long as we have technology in the world, it's going to uh, expand at an exponential pace, and we've already seen that uh, trillions fold already. Uh, and we're at a point now where we're at the steep part of the exponential. So as influential and as powerful as these technologies are, imagine them being a billion times more powerful in a mere 25 years from now and 100,000 times smaller. Uh, and it will be a very different era uh, in terms of our mission to protect our freedoms uh, as well as everything else we care about. Thank you very much.